it's a great pleasure to introduce Joe. We've, um, you know, TAG Corporation that Joe works for has had a great relationship with UE Systems for the past 10 years. We've, uh, we've really figured out a lot of uh, how to use ultrasound for electrical applications through working with, with Joe and his team. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have another veteran back. Uh, Joe does a great job on, uh, on the presentations. So it's, it's good to see you again, Joe. Thanks, Thanks Doug. Appreciate it, man. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as a kind introduction by Doug, uh, some familiar faces here, so it's good to see everyone I know and welcome to those who I haven't met. Um, I'll start off by saying I do not know everything, and, and that's obvious. Somebody said it the other day, if you don't learn something new each day, then you better find something else to do. Well, I really believe that. And when it comes to uh, electrical applications, I know it's a very popular subject out there, uh, throughout industry. I saw a couple presentations this week where uh, folks want to get into this and start doing it and folks uh, are doing uh, to some varying degree electrical applications in their travels. One benefit that I have is our organization consists of an international network of electrical contractors. So I got the good fortune of having probably six or 700 technicians out there in 23 different countries who send me WAV files all the time and we work with in the field. Uh, some are problems, some are not. But you know, I, there's an old saying, I, who's heard the saying that says practice makes perfect? That saying is not true to me. Perfect practice. Huh? Perfect practice makes perfect. Well, true, or practice makes permanent is the way I like to say it. And what I mean by that is you could practice something all you want, but if it's the wrong way of doing things, it's still the wrong way. And that becomes permanent. So it, from my standpoint, being a support liaison for our uh, organization and, and our customers, I get to see a lot of these files that I might not otherwise get to uh, take a look at. And I've learned a lot in 10 years. I mean, you know, the good folks at UE Systems really helped springboard us into this. and had a lot of heart, uh, help from Mark and Gary and Doug and, and uh, the, the other guys, so I'm fortunate there. But we learn from each other, as Doug said, and that's very helpful. So what I do know I'm going to share today, and uh, based on some of my experiences, one of the most popular things I see in my organization and even at this event is Spectralizer and how to use it and what does it mean and how does it play a role in the electrical side. So for my benefit, uh, just show of hands, how many people are in fact doing electrical applications with ultrasound? Okay, not a very large percentage. How many of you regularly use the Spectralizer software for analysis? Gary, I know you do. Excellent. So there's something to learn for everybody here. And um, you know, I still get tips from Mark all the time on this stuff and I'm gonna show you what I uh, kind of how I go about analyzing things. And for those of you who have computers, uh, you should have got a memory stick with a folder of different waves that I've received over this past 12 months. And basically, uh, we're going to start off and I'm going to show you how I set this thing up and what I'm looking for for the different faults. And then we're going to play, you tell me what the problem is if it exists for the wave files I've provided. So they, you know, it's, this will make some practice here uh, based on these basic tips. So when I open up Spectralizer, uh, by default, you get the full range on the relative dB scale here on the left. And on the bottom, it defaults, what, 0 to 4K, I think. And for this particular application, that's too wide of a range on the frequency. Uh, for my purposes, I will always rescale this and leave it locked at about 900 to 1K on the frequency. This relative scale right here, what's the correct setting on that? Well, it depends on what I have for a recording. I mean, the right setting will be where I can analyze this best. And uh, there's a couple things I do to make it easier for me from the analysis standpoint. The other important thing is on top where it says the number of samples. And everybody who uses this probably knows that um, you have a number of different selections here, and when you open this up or install it out of the box, it defaults to 4096. I personally prefer the 8192. Yes, sir. Oh, thanks, Mark. So by taking more samples and stitching them together in the FFT display, you get resolution on what you're looking for. And there's some important things 
relative to electrical faults that you need to see. And the lower resolutions don't have enough samples for me to definitively um, identify what I'm looking for. The higher samples can make false positives. Everybody understand what I mean by a false positive? It could look like something's there when it really isn't. So the happy medium I found through experience is 8192 on the number of samples. Now, the two tools that I use, and I really got to get better with the waterfall because I've been working with that, but I'm not confident enough to talk about it on it today. But in electrical, there's five or six things we're interested in. Everybody knows the basic ones, right? What are the faults in electrical systems? What kind of faults do we see? Arcing? Corona, tracking, partial discharge, that's right, within insulating systems, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, and mechanical faults. We have vibration, we have looseness, uh, we have separation, missing components, things like that. All of these different faults, and, and those of you who have been here the last few years, I've done several papers on this, and I call it um, uh, spectral footprints. Every one of those faults has a footprint that I'm looking for, and no... Uh, two faults of the same type are exactly identical in either the FFT or the time series. But what's proved to be effective to me is if I can find enough of those um, basic similarities that I'm looking for in a footprint, then I can usually make pretty good judgment calls with a high degree of confidence. Okay? So that's kind of how I set this up before I do anything else. The time domain we'll get into here in a little bit. So one of the most popular faults I see all the time is tracking. It's more common to me than arcing because what does arcing represent? Failure. It's already in failure, isn't it? And Mark, I remember the first time I took a class with him, he said, if you hear this, you better run. And I agree with him because it is failing right before your very eyes. You know, sometimes you're fortunate enough to uh, capture it. Other times it lets you know it's there through a failure. But tracking is very popular. What exactly is tracking? And, resistance sorry? Resistance High resistance path. Or it doesn't even have to reach Earth yet, does it? Basically, it's a discharge of energy along an electrical insulator at first. And, you know, what would cause that? Contamination, moisture, uh, the integrity of the insulation being damaged, things of that nature. Always a byproduct with tracking if it's happening. Anybody know what it is? What does tracking leave behind? Well, that's, that's on Corona. We'll talk about that shortly. Carbon. Is carbon a good electrical conductor? Very good, isn't it? So there should be some visual evidence if tracking has taken place, right? Not always. And depending on where it's taking place, it may be obscured from your vision. So really, the ultra probe becomes not just your ears, but your eyes in a lot of ways when a visual inspection is impossible. There are some key things about arcing in both the frequency analyzer and the time domain that I personally look for. And I'll start with the FFT, because I've said it in papers gone by, and, and you've heard it many times, you can't use just one tool or the other and be effective. It's impossible for, for this application. Now, maybe it's possible in some other applications, but not electrical. What should we see if, if I have a fault that is electrical in nature, what would you suspect the footprint on this frequency analyzer would be? Sorry? There will be line, multiples, some uh, 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 frequencies that are multiples of the line frequency. That's right, if it's a fault, we're gonna see fault frequencies. What else? Well, you hear it called a couple of different names. I think what you coined was frequency noise. And what I mean by frequency noise is the content or activity that's going to take place in between each one of these harmonic markers right here. So those two things are what I'm going to be looking for in the FFT. Do I have frequency peaks to some degree? And do I have an elevated or abundant level of frequency noise in between the harmonic markers. Now, I mean, invariably the question comes up, well, how many frequencies? I don't know. It depends. Because I, I can't go just by the FFT, I have to go by the tonal quality of the sound I've recorded as well, right? 
because everything we hear, we can guess without uh, using this, what the fault is or if it is in fact a fault, right? Our ears would never deceive us, would they? Do you think things sound similar that can be dramatically different? I've seen that and I'll show that to you, but also there are things that can look very similar that are dramatically different. So we have to use everything at one time when we talk about a fault. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was the 2010 conference, I did a paper on, um, what was it called? Electrical equipment screams for attention. Anybody remember this by chance? <laughs> so I gave a lot of examples and played some files here, but I thought just to start out before we start playing, we'll go back and revisit this and show you kind of my approach when I get a suspicious recording. This lineup of equipment here, if you remember, was a unit substation on the sixth floor of a hospital in Charleston, South Carolina. And what was happening was this 13, two, or 13 8 kV switch had an emission that a technician sent. He, he identified something suspicious and said, will you take a look at this and uh, let me know what you think. So the recording that he sent me and just listening to the tonal quality, how would you characterize that sound? Huh? A bearing. Leave it to Sean. You, you think Sean has tunnel vision on mechanical applications? If I told you that this was a air switch that's 13,000 volts, what would you think if you heard this in the earphones? Sorry? Uh-oh. What should an air switch sound like with the ultra probe? How about nothing? You know, that's an important thing too, distinguishing what should be there versus what you actually hear. Do we have components in the system where there's naturally going to be ultrasonic emissions? Yeah, so we have to distinguish what's good and bad there as well. But on an air switch like this, you shouldn't have anything but silence. So that should raise a red flag right away. Now looking at the frequency spectrum here, the way I do this, I like to have the entire view filled up with my view of the FFT. So I will adjust the relative scale based on my highest and lowest peaks that I have in the recording here. So out to about 900, I'm not going to worry too much about that. But if I adjust this to a negative 44 for a top number, and the way you do that, just double click. If you don't know, it'll highlight this black and type in negative 44. And on the bottom here, at, uh, I've got this set on 50 hertz. Is that the right frequency setting if I'm in the US? What should it be? 60 hertz, right. So we're going to change that. All right, and I'm going to replay the file here. All right. What can you tell me by looking at the frequency spectrum here set up in this fashion? Does anything stand out? I'm sorry? There's no 60s out here, right? But if I come further out in the spectrum, I got a couple right there, don't I? And one more right here. That's way out in the spectrum, isn't it? There's a couple of 60 hertz harmonics. Nothing in the beginning though, right Gary? What else is noteworthy about this? I'm sorry? Well, the amplitude is an interesting thing because here, that really means nothing to me. On the time domain, different story. We'll talk about that in a minute. But more, more specifically, what's going on in between there's a lot of frequency content. Does everybody see between every harmonic, there's a lot of activity right here, right? Those two things right there are the footprint I look for that tells me one thing and one thing only. Anybody want to guess what it is? It is electrical. 
It tells me it's an electrical fault in nature. The frequency peaks and the high concentration of frequency noise says, hey, this is electrical. Could I have a bunch of 60 hertz here or 50 hertz if we're overseas and lack this content in between each of the harmonic markers? Yep. What would that tell me? It's energized. Or maybe it's mechanical. In it. It's not electrical. That's what it's telling me. Whatever this is, it's not electrical. Those are the two things I get out or look for from a footprint. Because what I'll show you here in a minute is tracking like I'm playing you now. And this is actually going to be classified something different. But uh, tracking and arcing look almost identical on the frequency display. Did you know that? They have the same footprint. So how would you distinguish one from the other if all you use is the frequency analyzer? I mean, everybody knows the sample wave files that are provided to you when you download Spectralizer, right? You get the arcing, tracking, good bearing, bad bearing, things like that. Is everybody familiar with them? Okay, so if you play those two together right here, and I'll just bring it up. So, spectralizer data. Okay, and if I play this tracking sample, and we'll set it as an overlay, you're familiar with the tonal sound right here. Okay, and I'm just going to pull this down a little bit. And there we are, we've got some 60 hertz peaks, right? There's one here, here, one right there, and then nothing really stands out further in the spectrum. But the other thing that's predominant is what? The frequency noise. Everybody sees that, right? We know tonally what that sounded like through the headphones. Now, if I play arcing on top of this, which we know this is where it's failing, Totally different tonal sound, right? But looking at the spectrums, and I'll adjust this just to make sure we can get both of them in the view. I'm going to change this minus 58 to a minus 65. All that does is condense it a little bit and allow me to see both frequency spectrums for both recordings, right? What does the arcing have down here that's the same as the tracking? Frequency noise looks almost identical, doesn't it? And we've got some 60 hertz harmonics that are hitting on the markers, right? So which one is which if that's all I did was show you this? Could you figure it out? Because if you can, I want to know how. I ain't been able to do it. This is one tool for me that tells me it's either electrical in nature or it's not. If it's electrical in nature, you will have some 60 hertz harmonics and an abundance of frequency content in between each marker. If those two things are missing, it's not electrical. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so now that I know it's electrical, what, the, um, uh, what type of issue I'm dealing with, I have to find out two more things. I gotta know what it is, right? Because I can't tell from here. But just as importantly, I need to know how bad it is. Is that important to you? Severity is a key thing, isn't it? Because somebody said the other day, you always get asked the question, well, when's it going to fail? I always say, I'm an electrician, not a magician. I don't have a crystal ball. But we can be somewhat predictive here in how bad it really is. Because uh, I think, Tim, you said it, you know, I think it was you or Chuck that said, <laughs> you cannot let the equipment dictate when you repair it. If it does, it's going to cost three times as much and take ten times as long to do, right? <clears throat> so I need to know how bad this thing is, but I also need to know what type of fault I am looking for. Once I prove this, I'm going to move over to the time analyzer. And when I come over here, I'm going to go ahead and play the tracking again. We all know what this sample file looks like. But my question to you, how would we characterize what we see? What can you tell me about this 
um, spectrum here that we're looking at, the full, what, or the uh, slice of it here, about 900 milliseconds. What stands out? Very uneven. Does everybody understand what that means? Now amplitude's gonna play a role here. Is the, um, uh, the depth of each one of these excursions uniform across the recording? Not at all. And if you look at the entire six and a half second recording by double clicking the stop button, you can see there's clearly differences in the peaks and valleys of those, I call them excursions. I mean, call them what you want. My, my term is excursions. So what does that tell us about something electrical in nature? If I see these peaks and valleys here, what does that mean? Louder and softer. So the intensity of the discharge is not constant, is it? Some discharges of energy are higher in intensity than others. The other thing that it tells me, or that I need to find out on here, which is key to severity in my opinion, is how frequently are the discharges occurring? Does that make sense? I mean, tracking is tracking, arcing is arcing. What makes the difference is how intense it is and how often it's taking place. Because you can have dramatically different faults, and I'm gonna play that transformer arc here in a second or trans, uh, that we talked about to demonstrate this. But how can I tell what the frequency of the discharge is? Any ideas? What would I do right here to look at that? I need to zoom, magnify the view a little bit and slice this time down. And my preference, this is just me. You can find what works for you, but I like to see between a quarter and a half second sample of the recording. From an electrical cycle standpoint, I mean, we talk about 50 hertz overseas, 60 hertz here in the Americas, right? What does that mean for the non-electricians? What does 50 and 60 hertz really mean? Cycles per second. So on an alternating current system, you have a, um, a sine wave that changes polarity from positive to negative, positive to negative, 60 times every second. So when it comes to these faults, if you can, uh, if you can relate the discharges of energy down to the electrical cycle level, it helps to understand what we're seeing in the time analyzer a little better. And back in, God, it was 2005, I think Mark and I were over in Australia together. He put together a good graphic on this and I used it in a paper a couple years ago. But this is what an electric sine wave looks like, right? So 60 times every second, you have this thing changing polarity. Now, on a normal sine wave with no noise, no tracking, arcing, you would not have any, I'll call it a wave shape altering at the cycle level. When the discharge of energy occurs, one electrical cycle is the equivalent of 16 milliseconds. So with this tracking that we just played, is it a, 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 an intermittent event or is it a continuous event that's taking place in the recording? Well, I mean, did you hear any periods of silence in the recording? So it's a continuous event in that sense, right? Now, all, what that's telling us, if we look at it from this, le uh, this level, is somewhere every 16 milliseconds, we have energy being discharged along an electrical insulator or, or to a high resistance path to ground. Now, if we've got current flowing to ground, what else will that produce? What does current flow generate? Heat, so you should be able to see it with an infrared camera, right? Do you always? No, especially if it isn't current flow. We're not talking about current flow here when it comes to tracking per se, it's discharges of energy along something that's supposed to not allow discharge of energy. So you have these releases. You hear the snap, crackle, pop in the recording, right? The buzzing, I think it's, that's how it's been characterized to me for years. Oh, it's a buzzing sound with snap, crackle, pop on it. Well, that's true. What are them snap, crackle, pops? Those are the discharges that are taking place. 
Are some louder than others? So some must be more intense than others, right? And that's represented, if we go back to the spectralizer, represented how in the time domain? The excursions tell us what pops are louder than other pops. Does that make sense? Now, where, as it applies to an electrical cycle, would those discharges take place? I'm sorry? Depending on what the fault is, right? Some faults do that at the highest stress. With tracking, it's really interesting because anywhere on this, we'll just break it down to one cycle and keep it at 16 milliseconds. How many times could it go snap, crackle, pop in 16 milliseconds? It could go a lot or a little, right? So I got to look at that and because I know it's a fixed time base on when, uh, uh, when a cycle takes place, if I have additional components that cause a wave shape change, for lack of better words, this discharge of energy, that can and does occur at any point in that 16 millisecond time base, right? Is that going to be a fixed predictable discharge from a time standpoint? Not at all. Can the time analyzer help me to visualize that? Sure. So if I take 15 or 20 of these and I have that recording that we played back here, right now I'm looking at the entire six and a half second recording here. But I can slice that up and look at just 15 or 30 cycles and get a better idea of how, uh, how big the discharges are and how uniform or non-uniform in time that it is taking place. See, the thing about tracking and arcing, it's not predictable from a time standpoint. I mean, we'll get to arcing in a minute, but tracking, even though it's a continuous buzz with a snap, crackle, pop, those snap, crackle, pops are not taking place at equal times on the sine wave predictably. Does that make sense? It, it's very random when it happens. And the only way we can see that is to use the time domain tool to look at the spacing in between these discharges. What does spacing mean on this display? Time. I mean, that's what the, uh, uh, the x-axis is down here, isn't it? Time. But this is all compact here. You're always going to have this broad band of white noise on the time analyzer. That's just the instrument noise itself. I mean, that's always going to be there. And, you know, we're talking, I, the first one I played was that air switch, right? So how many excursions or discharges should I see on that white band of noise? I shouldn't see any. So if there's any deviations when I look at what the sound, or, or, or take the sound and visualize it, if I see any excursions, is that cause for alarm? It's going to validate what I'm hearing, right? So. I'm going to use the tool up here. You have several magnifying tools where you can slice up this time analyzer. And if I come in here, I, I like this middle top tool here where you just take and cut a whole piece of it out. My preference, you can choose what you like. <laughs> but if I pick a point in time here, I don't know, I'll just grab this. And what we see now is I've sliced it up from 4.7 seconds to 5.4. So this is what? About a 0.7 second view of the recording, right? And I can get some ideas here. I know that the amplitude is changing throughout the recording consistently. That's a key thing for tracking, right? It's going to be consistent. When we look at the time analyzer where you have uh, changes or variations in these excursions. That's a footprint. Does that make sense? There's no periods of silence through the entire recording. And when we look at the discharges of energies, they're not uniform in, in uh, intensity or time. That's tracking's footprint. I mean, if you can characterize it and then visualize it with here, the next step is going to be to do what for your boss or your customer? I'm sorry? Well, look at severity. That's right. How frequently is it occurring? I'm also going to want to report that back, aren't I? How many people have used the report feature in Spectralizer? I know Gary has. Not many of us, right? There's a great reporting tool in here because the bottom line is this. 
we got to put a picture on a sound. We agreed right at the outset, all these sounds that we hear and what we record, can your ears be fooled? Can you think it's one thing and it's really something else? I know that's happened to me. Without visualizing the sound, there's no way you can be sure or communicate that to either your supervisor or your customer. So we got to put the sound in a visual format that can actually explain what they're listening to. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I've got this picture in front of my customer, I can play them the recording and they hear what they hear, right? But then I can explain to them, okay, this is the type of fault we have going on and here's why. When you look at tracking, what am I looking for? So I'm gonna set a frequency picture next to a time domain picture. And I'm gonna say what I'm looking for in tracking because we're dealing with a 60 hertz system, I'm gonna see a couple of these fault frequencies on the harmonic markers. How many, who knows? I mean, the jury's still out on how many should be there or whatever. I've found no pattern. I've seen as little as one fault frequency. I've seen as many as six or seven. But the fact is they, they exist. And then the key thing is the frequency noise in between there, the activity in between the markers, tell me what? Electrical. So now I can say, this is why it's an electrical fault, Mr. Customer. And then I move to the time domain and I put the picture on what it is, how bad it is, and how frequently the discharges are occurring. So I explain to the customer, here's what tracking looks like from a time standpoint. And I'll explain it to that level I just showed you with the electrical sine wave. There's discharges taking place every 16 milliseconds in a wanton fashion. Very random time bases where the discharges take place. And I can look at this and slice it up and show them the differences in time when that's occurring. So if I want to go to an even smaller time base, what do I have there? Well, 5.1 to 5.3. So now we're about a third of a second, right? What did that do to my view? You have a little more resolution on what's going on in between the discharges. So now you can see, at least in that third of a second, what? Well, we know there's changes in intensity, but how frequently is it occurring? Is it perfectly uniform in this one third of a second? Everybody see that? I mean, here's a couple of uh, uh, discharges here that's on, at less than tenth of a second, and then you have this gap here with something in between, another one here, but the spacing, if you look all the way across here, is not perfectly uniform, is it? And I'll have even a couple better ones here for you too that illustrates that even further. So if I don't have uniformity in when the discharges or the excursions take place, that's a footprint of tracking. Over that 16 milliseconds, every 16 milliseconds, it's taking place at different points in time. Does that make sense? So with those two things, I can be very confident going back to the customer with a, uh, a uh, report saying, here's what you got. Now, am I always going to have the ability to look at what I am recording? Not always. I mean, what's one thing the Ultra Probe is great at doing? You have to have equipment up to use it effectively, uh, opened up to use it effectively. No. Yes, sir. Even though your amplitudes are different, yep. it looks to me like something happening on your spacing at the... Exactly. But your amplitudes may vary. Well, right. All the amplitude variations tell us is that the intensity or how powerful the discharge of energy is, is not the same. There, there's, there's more intense and less intense discharge. That's that snap, crackle, pop you hear on the recording. And then the spacing in between just tell us it's very random when that's taking place. Now the final step on severity, because I hear this question all the time, how bad is it? How many times have I seen that in a presentation this week? How bad is it and when's it gonna fail? Good question. 
What I've learned is this gets more severe because what does tracking ultimately turn into? Arcing. That's when you're going to find, you know, it's jumping a gap or finding the path to earth, right? And interestingly enough, the worse tracking gets, the more compacted these excursions become, the more frequently it's taking place. I mean, what's going to be a worse situation? If you've got a 10 second recording and you have tracking that's taking place, but you only get two excursions in that 10 seconds, or you have a display like this, which one's worse? Definitely this one, right? And the more frequently the discharges of energy take place, the more of these excursions you'll see and the less space in between them. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, when it turns into arcing, this is going to change dramatically. You're actually going to see drop, uh, drops in the excursions or periods of silence. Remember that characterization of arcing? It's quiet and it's fully discharging. It's quiet and it's fully discharging. So that pattern disappears on here. But for tracking, that's what you're looking for. The frequency domain tells me it's electrical or not. The time domain tells me what I got, how severe it is, and the intensity of the discharges. Yes, sir. Joe, with this spacing that we see on this particular waveform, yep. are you going to get excited about that one? I mean, I know it's going to degrade over time because one thing I've learned in my experiences, and again, say I don't know everything, but I was out on my tools for 20 years as an electrician in industrial plants, and I've learned that once something begins to fail, it never changes direction. It's going to fail. It never gets better on its own. So if I see this, I mean, there's some other variables that's going to factor into how I present this. You know, if I got this and it's on a, uh, uh, a, uh, a sump pump in a closet somewhere, I'm not going to be too worried about that, but if it's this 13-8 switch, I'm going to be terribly concerned. Does that make sense to everybody? Those are the footprints I'm looking for ju just on tracking. Now, let's apply, yes sir? From back here, it's hard for some of the guys to see, you know, just so far back. Um, you want Doug's glasses? Smaller, uh, do what? You want Doug's glasses? No. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mike. Um, can you point out the smaller discharges that are much less in amplitude? Oh yeah. Back here, all your, you, you key in on the big discharges. Well, Let's pick these three here. You see this one, this one, and this one are higher than anything else, right? But if I look over that time period, down here at a much lower amplitude, Mike, how many other discharges are taking place, right? So these ones here are still an excursion, and that's a discharge of energy. But the spacing between this discharge and this discharge, and then this one and that one, this one and this one over to here, if you look at that, is not uniformly proportioned. That's what's telling us it's, it's totally random points in time over each electrical cycle. Does that make sense? Now let's apply this. Uh, yes, sir. I'm not going to dispute that, but what's going on in between it? Yeah, there's other stuff exactly. Your major 16 milliseconds ties into your frequency, which is where you want to be. And your potential stress, right? Exactly. You got to peak at every 16 milliseconds. That probably coincides with the positive portion of the sine wave. We have more propensity because the higher voltage to sure. discharge. Yep. That, that gives you your initial discharge. Exactly. Exactly. That, that's a good way of putting it. Thank you. Well, that's what we were just discussing. The major ones here are going to be at high stress points. But in between each peak, there's a bunch of junk going on there. And you can hear that. And this stuff in here helps none of this in between the major ones are uniform in time or the amplitude. And that's the key thing right there. So it's almost like the, the, the 60 hertz is triggering right. the start of the initiation of the event. And then the tracking just follows around there. That's right. I, that's how I'm going to visualize it. Does it make sense? Okay, so this, this actually works 
pretty well. That's, that's all you do. And that thing that I, I credit Mark for that, that was a great tool to help people understand that. Okay? So if I apply these, this concept, and I've, I've actually got another one that shows this even better. Well, that is a 30 amp breaker. You ever think you got tracking on a 30 amp breaker? You think that can happen? Oh, absolutely. You better believe it. How long was it that people said, oh, you can't have ultrasonic emissions below 1,000 volts? I heard that more times than I care to remember. But right here, it was this one. If you heard this, what would you think? How do you characterize that sound? Not good is a good way. Now, if I told you it was on a 30 amp circuit breaker feeding a server that was an inventory control system breaker, what do you think? I better look at this a little closer, right? Better fix it. Now, we got the, the amplitude is not as high on these, uh, this particular time domain, right? What does that suggest? It's a lower voltage, and the intensity of the discharges aren't as great as the previous one. Big deal. It's not as great. The voltage isn't as high, okay? When I zoom in on this, see if I can get the same spot I had before. The one I put in the uh, presentation a couple years ago, actually, I had it right where I wanted it to show, right here. Does everybody, anybody remember this time domain that I did a couple years ago? That is of this breaker. And when I slice this up to just a quarter second, to me, it clearly shows the differences in time across this quarter second. This is 15 electrical cycles. Not only is there differences in amplitude, but look at the spacing between the major ones, such as this big one, over to the next larger one, and what's going on in between here, and then all this junk in there. There is uh, absolute differences in the spacing. Is that tracking to you? based on what we just talked about a minute ago? Tells it to me every time. I mean, I, thank God for this tool because without it, how would you be sure? And tracking is the most common one. That's why I'm spending time on it. So let's go back to that first file I played you on the 13.8 uh, switch. What we heard was this. Right? Did it have the characteristic tonal quality of the snack crackle pop? Right? And being a 13-8 switch, this is getting measured. One was with the, uh, we did both the airborne and the contact module. Which one's going to have a higher dB in that case? The contact module will. Why? It's closer when you think of it that way. A lot of mechanical applications, we talk about dB on the instrument too. What does dB tell you just for the electrical application? When you're using the instrument, that's it right there. I mean, with bearings and mechanical applications, we rely heavily on decibel level, right? All it means to us in the electrical applications is, where's the source? How close am I to it? That is an important thing to remember. Because, you know, I've had guys that, uh, uh, you know, say, oh, well, this dB increased to this over this period of time, therefore it's getting worse. No. dB cannot be used as a gauge for how bad something is in electrical. You have to rely on the time domain. Does that make sense to everyone? So with that sound, what can you say about this time spectrum right here? How would you characterize that? It's random. The amplitude's different across the entire recording. And does the spacing look like it might have some differences? Okay, so let's zoom in on a slice here. I don't know, just pick this one. Oops, that's further than I wanted to go. So if I come in here, that's about 218 milliseconds. Does that look like there's differences through this? other than the two majors we talked about with the stresses. It's got a footprint. On the FFT, if I run this, I'm going to turn the overlay off and just rerun this. 
What do you think about that frequency spectrum? We know what we're hearing, but how does that apply to this? Does anybody see anything that sticks out? There you go. There's one there. There's one there. Nothing really over here, right? But there's a couple of 60 hertz peaks. What else exists? All that frequency. See all this activity in there? That's a tip off. So it's what? Don't say tracking. It's electrical. Right? It's not a mechanical fault, it's electrical. How important are comparisons? I think that's important, huh? So if I had the opportunity, if this came to me in July, and I knew I was going down to the contractor location in September, do you think I'm going to go to this thing and check it again based on what he sent me? Oh yeah. So we had that opportunity in this case. And the interesting thing, you see my WAV files are called middle left and top left. Huh. Why would I name them that, folks? That's where I got my readings. But if this is on the same switch and it's only a couple of months later, why would it be two different positions? That's not a good comparison, is it? There you go. The, actually, what happened in this case was the angle of the emission had changed in that time. Does that make sense what I just said? Why would the angle of the emission in this particular case change? It's getting more severe. That's another indicator, right? I mean, Drew and I talk about this too, but think about an insulator up on a pole. What's the shape of these insulators up on poles? It's a cylinder, right? So can you only take one angle of measurement on an insulator? Or should you? Why not? You've got 360 degrees to cover, don't you? There you go. So if that has some type of fault that's causing, you know, corona or destructive corona or some type of arcing, over time, is that going to damage the insulator? Is the path of that damage going to change over that 360 degrees? So this, the, the angle of emission will change as well. You have to go all the way around. Am I right, Drew? Absolutely. He's glad I said that because we talked about it. <laughs> but this, this has nothing more to do than where the measurement was taken. And the reason it's in different spots is because the angle of the emission changed from July to September. So when we went back, same set. How important is it to set the instrument up the same way when you make recordings if you are trending? Very critical, isn't it? So same thing here, and this was the September recording. Does that sound totally different? What's the biggest difference on that? Now you got this hitting, right? Does everybody see that? One here, one there. Come out here, there's not too much, so it's shifted down here a little bit, hasn't it? A lot of noise still, and it's easier to show you from the old PowerPoint slide, and you have this in the proceedings manual, but if I go back to, um, let's see, it's up here. So this was the first time domain here on the initial recording in July and the sliced up view, and we agreed already you could see the variations, the differences in spacing. If I go to the one that was made in September, that's the time domain there. Same setup. Has it got worse over time? And how can you tell? Amplitude. <coughs> the amplitude is higher and more frequent. The dischargers are occurring at a more frequent pace. Does that make sense? So the more often it takes place, the worse it's getting. The other note where they point here is, like Drew said, the, the frequencies, the fault frequencies actually shifted to the lower frequencies there, more toward the line frequency, right? I think that has something to do with severity too, but I haven't got enough data on that to say it conclusively. But if it's got worse over time, does that mean the severity is increasing? Is, is the rate of failure increasing? Yes. 
Do I need to address it? You better believe it. Yes, sir. The reason you're seeing the harmonics in the FFT now is because you're now in a situation where the event has become quite repetitive, as you can see there. Yep. So if you're all three, you can see it, and the reason you're nice to go More predictable, in right? early stages, it's not a reflex, very slightly repetitive. Right. Fourier can't find it. So therefore, Fourier would give you all weird higher harmonics, and that's just the math. There you go. And that's right. It's the, the algorithm that's being done. It's very predictable if you have a very predictable event. So, so this is definitely the type of severity. Yes. Because as your tracking progresses, it becomes more repetitive, it happens more and more. It starts to happen every cycle of electricity instead of once every five cycles. Definitely. Excellent point. Definitely. Everybody here, Tim? So, does we make sense so far? I'm the fact that the, the event is becoming, if you're thinking about tracking, no, it's not. Right because he has a mic. He can't hear you. You got the mic, Doug? All right, here you go, Tim. That's an important point you're making. The, with the... Um, oh, is that on? Yeah. yeah. With the, uh, the initial reading, tracking is a very random event. It's a bzz, okay? And in the initial stages here, that r event is happening very randomly. And so what happens when you put that through the FFT analyzer, Fourier doesn't see it as a repetitive event, gets all fooled and just gives you a whole bunch of higher harmonics because he thinks there might be something there, so I'll give you that. Once you get to the later stages, now the, 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 the defect has progressed further. Now the tracking event is happening regularly. It's a cyclic event. It's happening every cycle of the electricity. And as you can see there, even though it's not real clean, there's a definite repetitive sequence of events. That gives Fourier something to get his teeth into, and he can see a frequency in there, and of course the frequency he'll see is line frequency. That's why you see the harmonics um, in the, the spectrum plot as you got more severe. So that is definitely an indicator of severity. The, this peak and that peak is going to be predictable every 16 milliseconds. Exactly. And that's what the FFT is seeing. Right. The, and then you got a lot of other garbage that's happening every cycle now, you start to see that as excursions on the time analyzer. Exactly. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So looking back here at the results, once it was able to be opened up, you may recall I told you this actually ended up being destructive corona. And the reason I call it destructive corona is what? Well, first of all, it's over a thousand volts, right? we're naturally going to have corona. And I, I haven't even discussed that yet, but um, when, when does corona become destructive? When you have too much of it. <laughs> too much of it, or it releases what? At least a six pack. <laughs> nitric acid. Nitric acid. And well, Maureen tried to have too much corona last night, I saw. <laughs> that was impressive the way you put the lime in there at dinner. Didn't even spill a drop, Maureen. I had to say I'm impressed. But the nitrates, we always talk about, that. you get a nitrate released by uh, the ionization process and that mixes with the moisture in the air, you end up with nitric acid. And nitric acid destroys electrical insulators. And we know the byproduct is what? The white powder. And if you see that, it's too late. That was clearly visible on these porcelain insulators and the conductors once we opened up the unit, if you remember, and it actually, what does that look like there? Remember that from a couple years? it discharged, didn't it? There's actually carbon here, meaning there was a release of energy as well. So this started to track across this Bakelite. And that, that when this thing kind of uh, damaged the insulator, I believe is what changed the angle of the emission. Because that's where it was highest intensity. Wherever the dB level is highest, that's where you know you're closest to the source of the emission. Okay, so does that make sense on tracking so far? Now how do you report this? Well. It's been made pretty easy recently. Once I have either of my um, tools set up the way I want them, and with FFT, what I like to do is always have at least one overlay on there with a known sample. What do I mean by that? If I suspect the recording I have is tracking, then I want something I know is tracking to lay on top of that for the purpose of the report. Why would I do that? Comparisons. I got to show the two similarities are present in both recordings. The frequency peaks, be it random or whatever, like Tim's saying, the more often it occurs, 
the more predictable it becomes. But on the known sample, it doesn't, does it have to be identical? Nope, I just gotta show the frequency paints and the noise content to say here's the similarities. On the time domain, I've been trying to get Gary to give me an overlay there, he just laughs at me. <laughs> but I'll just print the, the time domain. So if I have this recording and I set this as an overlay and I wanna play, you know, I'll just play tracking on top of it even though it was destructive corona for demonstration's sake. Oops, wrong one. So if I played this on top. Stop it there. Maybe this is the view that I want to present to the customer, okay? Down here in the uh, lower right hand corner, you have this checkbox or tick box, depending on where you're from, that says graph only. Anybody use this yet? I love this. What it's going to do is allow you to export a JPEG image of just this view. For my purposes in the electrical application, I don't need all the other information on the spectralized. It's not important to me for this. So if I select graph only and I say um, export this plot to a, um, oops, wrong thing. I thought that had the file on it. Where'd it go? Huh? I don't see it. Yeah, it, may, it might be, so let me see here. Is it to the far right? I wonder why I can't see that. It's the projector. Okay, well, yeah, it's cutting my, my view off here too. But there's a button that says to file. And when you select that, you can name the view and export it to a file. And it gives you just a picture. For my purposes, I can insert that into my software as the picture of my sound. Does that make sense to everyone? And that's very important to do for both frequency and time. Okay? Now, yes, Doug? I was just gonna suggest when you say frequency. Yep. I was ready to do that because I was gonna say, if every, is everybody okay with what tracking is, the footprints, how to set the spectralizer up and what to look for? That answers some questions, I hope. It's, it's probably the most common fault I see, especially on low voltage systems. So why don't we go ahead and take a quick five minute bio break if there's no questions. We'll come back and talk a little bit about new 